to get right into it because I'm excited to share this with you today. <sighs> Lord, we just uh, give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. We thank you that you are good all the time. All the time. Today, Father, you're good. Tomorrow, you will be good. Yesterday, you were good. You will continue to be good. And we walk in your goodness this morning. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for knowing us. Thank you for calling us unto you. Thank you for the privilege we have to serve you. Thank you for our brothers and sisters today who will die for what they believe in. Thank you for our brothers and sisters today who are persecuted and in prison because they stand on your word. We ask, Father, that you administer to them and their families. Make us vessels of your Holy Spirit this morning. Encourage us to be the people you want us to be and help us to get out of the way so the Holy Spirit can move the way he wants. And we thank you and we praise you. We lift up every family today uh, who will be grieving tomorrow for the loss of their loved ones due to war and uh, the different things that have happened in the military. We ask Jesus that you would be with them, be with the grieving widows, be with the grieving widowers, be with the children who are fatherless and motherless so that we can do this today, so we can have that freedom. We give you praise and glory and honor for letting us be in a country where freedom is still put on display and is important. And we ask, Father, that the loss of all these individuals would not be in vain. Thank you for the privilege we have and the willingness they had to give up everything for the country that we get to live in. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. We're going to continue our series on Jacob. Last week, if you remember, uh, we talked about how he rolls the stone away. He goes to this well that he finds in the wilderness. He's gone on his way to find a wife. He has his dream, and in his dream he sees angels going and coming, and the Lord is showing him aspects of himself he can't find unless he goes through what he's going through. Now uh, he meets Rachel. She is a shepherdess, it says. She is at a well. She's there to give her sheep water and take care of them, so she's obviously a responsible person. And she goes out, and there's a big stone over the well, and he sees her and gets excited and runs up and moves the stone because he wants to make sure she can get the water. Well, he decides he's going to stay with Laban, who is his uncle. And he's staying with Laban. He's traveled all this way. We talked about it and said it's about a two-week walk if you go 30 miles a day to get to where his family is. We're going to look in Genesis today. 29, and we're going to finish this chapter, and then we're going to talk for a little bit today about reconciliation and being despised. This is what it says. This is the uncle, Laban. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go into her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob. And he went into her, and Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came, came to when the Lord's... Oh no, too far... <laughs> Oh, did it not copy? All right, that's fine. So this is what happens. He goes in and he marries his wife, right? And the, all that means, and I know this is tough in our society, but all that means is they slept together. They had sex. They consummated their marriage. That was the breaking of a seal and the start of a covenant between them. He goes in. There's a wedding, a celebration. He has worked seven years. He is excited. Have you ever been excited for anything? Have you ever had anticipation build up in your heart and excitement? Have you ever waited and waited for something to happen and then it finally does? And not only is there a release of stress 
and build up an anxiety and other emotions inside of you, but there's an incredible joy in finding the end of the thing you have pursued. He is seven years working to marry this woman. In their culture, it's the ancient Near East, and the ancient Near East, you did not see your bride. They would cover her. That's where the idea of a veil comes from. And you could only see her eyes. And even then, it was dark. They were getting married. He gives his wife to him. He brings her into the tent. They have sex. He wakes up in the morning. He looks over, and his stomach drops because that is not the woman he worked for for seven years. That is her sister. Can you imagine finding yourself in that situation? Don't raise your hand and don't nod if you have. You know what I'm talking about, though. Seven years of excitement and expectation and build up to be utterly disappointed. Now, it says in what we read that Leah's eyes were delicate. Uh, Other translations have it listed as weak. Other translations say they were kind. She had eyes that didn't have life or spirit in them. She was a woman who was the oldest, but didn't have any of the features that people would want. She is what we are going to focus on today, and what I call the despised. She's the person who, even though she should have some level of appreciation, and should be seen as the oldest, and should be seen as someone who is going to be a positive influence in her father's life, in her family's life, she's just kind of passed over. Have you ever been passed over? Maybe you've dealt with the excitement and the fulfillment of dreams, but maybe you've gotten to the point where it seems like your dreams will be fulfilled, and then when you finished, you were disappointed. When I finished my master's, I will never forget, I woke up the next Saturday, and I was like, oh, i got to write a paper. And I was like, wait, I'm done. And it was the weirdest feeling because for so long that had been my rhythm, that had been my routine. And I had achieved the goal I had pursued, and all I found at the end was a piece of paper that hangs on a wall. There was no explosion of excitement. There was no joy overcoming. It was just another thing that I had accomplished, and I was thankful I accomplished it. But it was just a thing. Where was the relief? Where was the freedom? Where was the excitement? I still woke up feeling bound. I still woke up expecting to have to do something I didn't really have to do. What in the world am I supposed to do? And so I had to figure out how to manage my time. Maybe you have been there, though. Maybe you've experienced the ecstasy of the fulfillment of something or the lack and frustration of watching something die that you thought would be something else. It's a hard place to be. There are many characters in this story, and we're going to go through them a little bit, and we're just going to talk about what do you do when you're despised? That's what I want to talk about. I prayed about it for a long time, and I felt like I completely took a different direction than what I thought I was going to do. And we're going to talk about what does it mean to be despised? What does it mean to not be wanted where you go? Have you ever felt that way? Maybe you feel that way right now. You ever go to like a holiday dinner, and you can tell they were waiting for you to get there, and when you get there, nobody's talking anymore? (laughs) No, that would never happen to anyone here. You ever go visit your children, and they get real quiet when you're near them? (laughs) You ever take a stand at work and now your coworkers don't want to talk to you? You ever try to do the right thing and not, not interject and then people get angry that you didn't or you do interject and they get angry that you did? Maybe you've experienced some of the places that I call the despised. The person who no matter what they do is never included or wanted. Maybe you have childhood memories of playing dodgeball or kickball and being picked last. Maybe you know what it's like in relationships and you found a spouse that you thought you'd be with forever only to find out that wasn't the case. Or a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Maybe you thought your children could never hurt you as badly as they have. And it makes you feel despised. It makes you feel Rejected. It makes you feel like you don't belong. It's hard to feel like you don't belong. 
And Leah absolutely is a character who finds herself in that place. Her father had to trick a man to marry her. Now imagine you were her. It's interesting because as I studied this, I found that some scholars believe she was in love with Jacob. She watched him. She would have watched him work for seven years, this good-looking, sweaty shepherd. You ladies know. The rugged, handsome looks in the pastures and the fields doing what he's supposed to do. We know he was a great shepherd. We learn that later. We learn all about how incredibly intelligent people were back then, even though a lot of people in our generation might write them off. He figures out how to breed things with husbandry and other skills. He knows about agriculture. He is a brilliant man. She falls in love with him. That's the only reason she would have ever complied with what her dad wanted. So, Jacob wakes up next to her. This is not the woman I worked for. <laughs> he goes and confronts Laban, and he says, how could you do this to me? This is not the woman I worked for. I worked for Rachel. And Laban says to him, well, in our culture, you have to marry the older daughter first. Finish your week with her, and then I'll let you marry Rachel, but you have to stay another seven years. So he agrees. So what's interesting is we know and established a couple weeks ago now that the name Jacob means deceiver or supplanter, one who grabs the heel. The idea that he is someone who does things backwards. He does things to further his own goal and agenda. And now Laban has deceived the deceiver. He has tricked him into staying and giving up seven more years of his life. Jacob, of course, agrees. We know from the text he clearly is in love with Rachel and wants to be with her. But Leah he despises. He stays with Leah for a week, as was their custom, and they do what married couples do for a week, and then at the end of that week, he throws her to the side, and he marries Rachel, and it tells us in the text that he loved Rachel. And Leah he despised. Go ahead, Sandy. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb. Just real quick, I find it fascinating that even when we find ourselves in a position of being despised, God sees it. He sees it. We know that because it tells us when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved. She was unloved. But that matters to God. He didn't have to open her womb. He didn't have to do anything. He could have said, eh, no big deal. Just push her to the side and, okay, well, uh, you know, Rachel's the one he wants anyway. It's all going to work out. No. God knew what her heart must have felt like. And so he opens her womb, it tells us, and it says, but Rachel was barren. So she has all the physical looks. She has everything good about her. She presents in a healthy way, and yet she can't have children. And we've talked about before in here how not being able to have children was like anathema to a woman. It was the end of a family line. It was the idea that if you can't further my generation and our focus as an ancient Near Eastern culture would have been on inheritance, you're not even going to give me an heir to give my things to, you have very little value. And it creates in Rachel, the confident, strong shepherdess, a streak of bitterness as she watches her sister, who she despises and is not happy, is there. And her sister watches her, and they start to fight. And this is where we get to really the focus I want to focus on with you. Leah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Reuben, for she said, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore... My husband will love me. Can you imagine feeling like that? Being in a loveless marriage and thinking to yourself, well, at least I gave him something he wanted. Now he has to love me. I wonder if you've ever found yourself doing that in a relationship or with friends. Maybe not to the same extent. Maybe your kids aren't named Bitter or My Son or something like that. But we all go through periods of time like this, where we feel rejected and we feel pushed away and we're willing to compromise and hope that maybe in our compromise we can get the people to the place we want them to be. 
Have you ever been there? What are you willing to compromise to find love? And what if you started to compromise things thinking that was the only way you could be loved when it tells us right before this that God saw her? Wait a minute. So she is aggressively working for the approval of a husband who does not want her when all along God sees her? She's been despised. She's been rejected. She's been forgotten. She's been used as bait to trap a man for seven years. She, every negative possible thing you could think of, she has been through. And she thinks to herself, at least I gave him a son. He'll love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Watch the evolution of her emotions. You're good, Sandy. Go ahead. The evolution of her emotions as we go through this. Because what I did is I went and I grabbed every name and figured out what it meant. And we're going to go through them after this. And I want you to see the evolution of how her emotions change over time in her marriage. A marriage where she has been used as bait, where she has been deceived and used as an implement of deception. A marriage where she marries the man that she does love, but he wants nothing to do with her. There is a healing that happens in her heart, and you can see it in the way she names her children. I say that because your name back then was more than just what you were called. It was a character mark of your identity. A character mark of your identity that would be used to designate who you were, what you stood for, and why. So her son Reuben means a son. Look, a son. You'll see, it's in the text and the translations I have, but the word Ben means son, which of course made me laugh this week because I started to think every time my parents would have said, oh, this is my son, Ben, they'd go, oh, this is my son's son. <laughs> made me laugh. It's stupid. I think it's funny. <laughs> ben in Hebrew means son. Ruben. Then she goes with Simeon. That's her next son. It tells us this. This is now her third. She conceived again and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. Wait a minute. So he's going to love me because I had a son. It doesn't seem to take. Well, now that I had a second son, he's heard my cry and God knows I'm unloved. And now surely he's going to love me. Oh, he doesn't love me. Okay, well, now I've given him three sons. Rachel's given him nothing. She can't provide anything for him that he truly wants. So then what happens? The third one, what does she say? Oh, well, now because I've given him three, he'll have to be attached to me. Do you know how many people I have ministered to over my life now who thought, well, if the first boyfriend wasn't good enough, the second one surely will be. If I have a baby... He has to stay. Do you know many people I've ministered to in my life at this point who had three, four, five children with three, four, five different guys with the same false premise the whole time, thinking, oh, maybe if I have a baby, he'll be attached to me. He'll love me. He'll be in my life forever, and he can't abandon me. Maybe you've gone through that yourself. I know there's a number of single mothers in this room who have been through the ringer and had to deal with the heartache and difficulty of raising children alone. But what if God sees? What if in the depths of that hurt and your attempts to fix the problem, God has been watching all along and he sees where you are? What if the thing that is causing pressure all around you is you? What if you're your own worst enemy? What if you self-sabotage more than anyone else thinks you're going to fail? And so you get to a point where you think, Sir, surely I'll overcome. My husband will love me. He'll be attached to me. And then you do things to make sure that you don't succeed because you don't know what it looks like on the other side of that mountain. And it's easy to get trapped in our own minds and think, well, the first one didn't work, so the second one must. And the second one didn't work, so the third one must. And the third one doesn't seem to have worked. Guess what's coming now? A fourth! There's a fourth baby! Go ahead, Sandy. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Now I will praise the Lord. Now I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Then she stopped bearing. 
and Judah means praise. It is also the line that Jesus is through. He's the lion of Judah. The lion of Judah. Go ahead, Sandy. Reuben is her first son. It means behold a son. I told you, go ahead, Simeon, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, Levi is to be joined, and then Judah is to give praise or thanks to Yahweh. Stop right there for me. There's a number of other children that we will talk about in a moment, and a story that goes along with it that I will share with you as well. But I want you to reflect on this for just a moment. What is it about her life that brings her to the place of praise? What is it about her life? Because the first three times didn't take. Do you think maybe God changed her perspective over time? And she got to a point where she realized that after three tries, she was trying to find love, but trying to find it in the wrong place to begin with? That she thought that her security and comfort would come in proving that she could give her husband something he needed, when really it wasn't going to take? That it was God all along that was watching her and knew how she was struggling and loved her and wanted her to see what he would do in her life? I wonder if that's our story. When you think about your life and all you've been through, what has God brought you through up to this point? What things has he walked you through and how many of them were problems that you might have created for yourself? How many of them were problems that might have come up only because you self-sabotaged? Only because you were scared of what was on the other side? And what if God had been loving you all along and just waiting for you to realize it? Go ahead, Sandy. Next child born is Dan. Dan is born to Rachel's handmaid. Uh, A common practice back then was if you could not have babies, you had a right or a legal right if you had people who worked for you and they would be impregnated by your husband and then that would be your child through your handmaid. And so Dan is this child and his name means judge. And the reason she calls him that is because she says that, see, now I have a baby. God has judged that I'm just as good as Leah. Isn't it interesting that the one that's despised is the one that is envied? as something happens in her life, as she realizes who she is in God. There's an envy that builds up to the point where Rachel gets frustrated and says to Jacob, give me children or I'm going to die. And he gets angry at her and he says to her, am I in the place of God? I am not the one who closed your womb. So she cries out to the Lord. She comes up with this great plan. We always come up with great plans. And she names her son Dan, which means judge. Go ahead. They have a second one. Same handmaid. And this child is named Naphtali, which means my wrestling. My wrestling. And the reference here is she has wrestled with God and she feels like she has one because now she has two children. Go ahead, Sandy. Gad is born to Leah's handmaid. If it wasn't confusing enough for you, Leah is upset because now Rachel is having kids, or it seems like she's having kids, and we know from the end of her giving birth to Judah that her womb seems to have closed. So she gives her handmaid to Jacob and says, oh, give me more kids through her. Okay, so Gad. Gad is born, and she says, well, look, now I have a troop of men that I've given him. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? It's like the real housewives. That's all right. It's okay, Ed. We all know you watch it. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? You don't think this stuff is happening, but it happens in the Bible, and there's a reason for it. Go ahead. After Gad is Asher, same handmaid, and it means happy. Happy. God has made me happy. Go ahead. We're going to go through these quick. Issachar is then born to Leah again. And she names him, there is reward. There is reward in serving the Lord. Go ahead, Sandy. Zebulun means dwelling. I have dwelled with the Lord. I am with God. Now I have a son, and he, it's become our dwelling. Our family is through my children. Go ahead. 
Dinah is the last baby born to Leah. It is a girl, and her name means judgment, which is kind of funny. I had never connected those dots, but Dan being judge, Dinah means judgment. And she sees Dinah as a final judgment on her ability to have children, and she has Dinah, and that is the last baby she has. And so after Dinah, Rachel gives birth again to someone that you all know, go ahead, named Joseph, which means he will add, and this is the first natural child that she has. First natural child. And then she also gives birth to Benjamin, who I didn't put in here, uh, because that's a whole other story that we'll cover in a few weeks. But Benjamin is the last child, and she ends up dying in childbirth with him. In the midst of all this drama that's going on, uh, as she's giving the handmaid, and the other is giving the handmaid, and everything's going back and forth, and everyone's having kids, Reuben, the oldest son, is out playing in a field. He's around five years old, they think, and he finds this plant that has green stalks and white flowers, and he's trying to figure out what it is, and he takes it to his mom, and they realize it's mandrake root. And mandrake was known in that culture especially to be an aphrodisiac. It was a love potion. It was this idea that you could give it to someone and it would make them fertile. And so the way Leah ends up pregnant the next time is she says to Rachel, or Rachel says to her, can I have the mandrakes Reuben found? And, Rachel, and uh, Leah says, you have already stolen my husband. Are you going to steal my son's mandrakes as well? She was still bitter. She still had hurt in her heart. She had never dealt with the fullness of the rejection of being married to someone who did not want her. She had hurt and pain in her heart. And Rachel says to her, if you let me have the mandrakes, I will send him in to sleep with you tonight. So not only are you despised in a marriage where you're unwanted, but now you have to buy rights to sleep with the husband who doesn't want you to begin with. I don't know if you see how insane this situation is, but the hatred between the two of them that grew from these events became so severe that later on in the law, when Moses is writing down the laws of Israel, he sets it up where it says, if the son of a despised woman is the firstborn, they will receive the inheritance of a firstborn. In fact, they will get a double portion because their mother was despised, but they are still the heir. It was because of these situations. There is another section of the law that Moses also writes that says, a man may not marry a woman and her sister. I wonder why. I wonder why. Some of you smile like you dated sisters before. Don't do that. That's a bad choice. Their turmoil, their family is an absolute mess. We know going into this that Jacob's family life is an absolute mess. And so what I want to show you next week is the contrast between siblings that are start out okay and seem like they hate each other by the end because they're vying for the affection of one person and it is impossible for two people to have one person. And the antithesis of their relationship, which is Jacob and Esau, and how their reunion is a picture of health and wholeness and completeness. And now I say all that with this bottom line for you, and then we'll wrap up. This is the bottom line for you today. Jesus comes from the line of Judah, not the line of Joseph and not the line of Benjamin. And I was always fascinated by that because Rachel is this woman that he loves. He loves her. We know she's strong. She has fire in her eyes. She's exciting to look at. She's someone who seems like uh, she would have been great to be around. And then you have this weak-eyed woman who just kind of isn't even wanted and is despised. Do you know that God can bring incredible things out of your life if you find yourself in a place where you are despised? That even Jesus himself came down the line through a woman 
who was despised? And if you truly believe that God's hand is in everything, then you have to acknowledge the fact that even in being despised, it was her point of getting to a place of praise and praising God that led to the breakthrough and the seed traveling the way it needed to so that Jesus could be who he was and do what he did. And outside of her faithfulness to spend time with the Lord and be transformed in this relationship and move from a place where she was so desperate to make her husband love her to a place where she realized God loved her and she just needed to praise him, that is where the breakthrough came. And you can see it because even as they name their children and go back and forth like a Jerry Springer episode, you see that even in her foolishness and giving her handmaid and everything else, she's realizing as she goes, Lord, you have been faithful. You gave me a troop of children. You made me happy. You did what my husband never could. And there are people in this room right now, I believe this with all my heart, that are convinced that a relationship is what is going to fix the broken inside of you. And I want you to know that's not true. It's praise and it's worship. Praising the Lord and worshiping him. And I'm not just talking about standing around and singing. I know we do that and we call that worship. And that's kind of a Christian uh, you know, name that we use. But that is not all worship is. Worship is tithing. Worship is spending time with the Lord alone. Worship is crying out to him in your car or at work. Worship goes so far beyond singing fancy songs and playing nice melodies underneath them. It goes beyond hymns. It goes beyond the words that you speak. In fact, Paul says that he can interpret our groanings. When you worship God, all you're doing is you're putting yourself lower and you're lifting him up. Interesting that the God who let her go through all of those things and feel despised is the same God who saw how she felt. We tend to fall into a category, if we're honest, where God gets the blame 98% of the time for things that happen in life. Why did my child die? Why did my wife die? Why did my husband die? Why did I go through this? Why did I get divorced? Why don't my kids love God? Why is our culture so backwards? Why don't people know what gender they are? Why is everyone confused sexually? Why is there all this pressure to do the right thing? How come nobody can agree what the right thing is anymore? Why are there no standards? Why are there no laws? Why can people just walk out of stores with things and not be held accountable? Why don't we put people in prison for things they do wrong? Why do we let people kill each other? Why do people kill their babies? How come it's not considered a baby, even though it's in a woman, and God says he has knit the baby there. Well, on and on, and I could keep going because I talk fast and I think quick. But the reality is, everything that's upside down right now can only be made right by God. It's not litigation. It's not coming up with... Sorry, I saw your face, Gene. That's great. Uh, it's, not, it's not litigation. It's not coming up with a standard that you hold people to. God is the only one who can transform and change someone's heart. I'm not talking about the way they behave. You can give people a set of rules and they'll behave according to it, but it will not change their heart. She had her heart transformed, and it was because she finally realized that God saw and he knew how she felt, and it mattered. What if you made a commitment this week to stop the thoughts that run off on their own and convince you that God is against you and started to ask him to show you his fingerprints on different situations in your life where he was there even though it didn't feel like it? where he loved you even though it didn't feel like it, where he cared about you even though it didn't feel like it, where he knew how you would struggle and allowed you to struggle, but saw anyway because he loved you. I wonder if our lives would be different. I wonder if we would be transformed. I wonder if we might go through life a little differently and not be quite as bitter about the situations we find ourselves in and a little bit more grateful for the privilege of serving a God who sees. Are you despised? So was Jesus. Are you rejected? So was Jesus. 
In fact, Jesus was the most despised man who ever lived. Tells us in Isaiah that he would be despised. Are you despised? Do you feel left out? Do you feel unwanted? God sees. He sees. And he knows. And he cares. And he loves. So my question for you, as you know I love to ask, is this. If I am despised, am I willing to let God move in a way that messes up my thinking, that changes my perspective? Am I willing to let God reveal what he truly wants for my life? Am I willing to surrender to him? And am I willing to stand up and realize that he sees? When I lay in the bed and my back hurts, he sees. When I'm upset and hurt because I think about the kids that aren't there, he sees, and it matters. When I'm frustrated that my closet collapsed, he sees. You want me to keep going? I'll do every person in this room. <laughs> when I wake up and there's no one in bed next to me, he sees. When I feel so alone and frustrated because my kids are all stinky and they won't just listen and do what I need them to do for one day, he sees. That one applies to like most of the people here. He sees and he knows and it matters and he loves and being transformed by that love is the only thing that will change our lives and our community and our society and everything else that's the only thing if effort could have done it it would have been done by now it has to be the Holy Spirit so Holy Spirit I pray would you show some people how much you love them? Show some people in this room, even right now, your fingerprints, the moments where you saw, or even when things were difficult, even when they thought they wouldn't make it, you ensured they would. That you would move in the hearts and minds of every person in this room and bring them to a place where they can see that you are good and that you know and you see and it means the world to you that you are loving and that because you love us, you allow us to go through trials. Thank you, God, for Leah, the woman with weak eyes that nobody wanted, who you used to change the world forever and ever. Thank you for Leah, the despised woman that her husband was ashamed to have been with, this woman that you used to bring Jesus to the world. Thank you for Leah. And thank you for every person in this room right now who feels like her, who feels rejected and unwanted, who feels frustrated at the situations they find themselves in and feel hopeless. Show them, Lord. Show each person in this room that it's not the love of a person that's going to fix them. It's the love of a heavenly father. God Almighty. We surrender our lives to you. Transform us. Make us the men and women of God you want us to be. And let us heal. Let us find healing through our praise and our worship of you. Help us to worship you and praise you and believe you for the impossible. Thank you for all you're doing. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Amen. Next week, we're going to talk about reconciliation, but what it looks like when it's healthy with Jacob and Esau. God bless you guys.